So grace, it's a hard to define term. It seems as if every time we take hold of it, it seems to wiggle and squirm until it's gone. Or at least it's become cloudy and unimpactful. You know, some would say it's an unmerited favor or an undeserved gift or it's God's open hand as opposed to his fist. And all these definitions are close, but they're still inadequate. It's like making chicken noodle soup, but you leave the broth out of it. You still got chicken and noodles, but you lack the part that warms your soul. There's grace without Jesus. There's an eternal hope. But see, before we get to him, there's more to this story because grace is the apex of God's eternal glory. But if God is perfection, and of evil he can't even taste, and he made everything good, very good, there seems to be no need for this grace. So for grace to be grace, something had to occur. The allowance of sin where God's righteousness was obscured? <laughs> or at least that's how we perceive it to be. How narcissistic are we to think that God's eternal glory is dependent on me? What a futile thought and a foolish little mind, yet so many believers today want to hold that doctrine so divine. We want to say that the cross is for me. The cross is for me. I deserve salvation. Oh, really? Can I see your resume, please? Look, we can start with your best day. That should help your case. But even that's fit the garments and wrapping paper. You might as well just spit in Christ's face. Your best day is a disgrace and it's utterly offensive. If it's us versus God's wrath, we're 100% defenseless. But you want to say, wait a minute, man, I'm a good person. I follow all the rules. Check the book of Job. I guarantee you Satan and his demons are more obedient than you. And she says, crazy, man, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anyone. Check Matthew 5, 21. Hatred in your heart towards someone is the same sin according to God's son. That's the words of Jesus Christ. It's not me just nitpicking. So if you have ears to hear, I pray that you be still and you listen. But I digress. My whole point was to say that God is sovereign over sin. It's all part of his plan for his glory from beginning to end. So let's get back to the who of grace, the God-man Christ. It's more than words and definitions. It's his resurrected life. It's the scars in his hand and the wound in his side. It's his blood that was poured out so that we can have abundant life. You see, Christ on the cross with that blood down his face was more than a pardoning of my rebellion. It was him bearing God's full wrath in my place. That is grace. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that death is more than a pardoning of my sin, but it's him giving us power to walk in so that it's now no longer dependent on us, but what he did. Check Ephesians 2.10. So now when we think of grace, let's be reminded of Jesus and the humbling fact that he has entirely no need for us. See, the cross was for God's glory first, subsequently our joy. So let's approach his throne like a brand new little boy and understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg of grace. It's only just begun. So let's focus not on what we can do, but on what God has done.